there is this process of holiness, of the Holy Spirit in your heart, in your life, who's changing you from the inside out. He's making you more holy, more set apart. That's what holiness means. More holy than you were before. That's the process of sanctification. Last week, we started on this uh, journey of discovery. How do I become spiritually mature? Remember, spiritual maturity is an expectation. When we're born again in Christ, we're starting as that little baby. But there's an expectation that we don't stay there. What happens is God says, great, now that you've embraced the assignment that I have for you, I need to teach you how to love me. Because the truth is, no one can be a mature Christian and have never been in love with God. This is the, the step in our progression where really it starts to deal with our emotions. The challenge in this particular phase is that even as God wants to teach you love, we tend to bring this idea of romance into the process of spiritual maturity. Romance is what we like, but abiding love is what we long for. You can be infatuated. God, I love you so much. You're doing so many things. I, you know, you're teaching me. You're growing me. On the flip side, man, I just keep fighting this sin. I'm down in the dumps. Man, the trials and tests of my life are just so much. I'm surrounded by so many different difficult things. God, where are you? God, don't you even care about me? I thought you were my friend. I thought you loved me. And now you're leaving me here. And we began the danger of the roller coaster in our spiritual journey. Romance is circumstantial. Abiding love is constant. It's a place where God wants us to be, but the danger is it's not really a place where God expects us to stay. So that leads us to the question, how do I not be stuck here? We have to get past that emotions-based, surface-level love. We need to, to change it, to grow it into a deep, committed, truth-based this is going to help you, okay? Number one, romance can foster entitlement. Abiding love fuels humility. We feel entitled to the experience of the buzz. In other words, I have to have a sense of romance. If my life doesn't look like a Disney movie, I have missed out. And so you have this moment we're so close, and then what happens? Well, I feel entitled to the next moment. And now suddenly I can get resentful if that moment doesn't happen. Because I foster in myself the sense that love has to look even better. It has to look even more buzzworthy. You brought me flowers on a Tuesday. Now you need to bring me flowers and chocolate on a Wednesday. The problem is when you start to feel entitled to intimacy, you actually stop working for intimacy. As you start to manipulate it so that you can feel the romance when and where you want it, which is the opposite of what you actually want to have happen, because you don't want to tell somebody else that they should be intimate with you. You want them to want to be intimate with you. Number two, romance ebbs and flows. Abiding love runs deep and wide. We come to a, a, a deep, knowledge, a deep understanding of that love so that it then in turn changes how we live. And it gives us the stability that we need. Feeling is an indication of, but not a foundation for love. Don't confuse how you feel with how God is actually working. You know, sometimes God does his greatest work in you when you can't feel it. See, this is the danger of living for romance. You can have the romantic feeling, but it can be divorced from who you are. Romance can abuse vulnerability. Abiding love turns vulnerability into strength. Paul's not saying, my prayer for you is that you love Christ more. Now, I think we could all say we need to, right? But his prayer here is that you understand Christ's love for you. There is no possibility of true love without true vulnerability. 